Hello and welcome. We are so glad you're here. If you're with us on Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to get notifications when we have new videos. If you're with us on Zoom, drop a hi in the chat. We'd love to say hello back. If you are with us in person, hello, everybody. And if this is your first time here, go ahead and sign the guest book either in the lobby or at oakleafuu.org slash guest. Today's sermon is Footprints with Renee Brill. I'm so glad to have Renee back. Miss you, Renee. <laughs> all right, announcements. First of all, on Saturday, January 21st, the Texas UU Justice Ministry will be celebrating their 10th anniversary in Austin. Uh, they'll have some amazing speakers and will be getting ready for their Legislative Action Day coming up later this spring. Uh, you know, Got to work on that legislature, right? <laughs> all right. Child care, scholarships, and home hospitality are all available. So if you would like to go and represent UUCOC, or if you'd just like to get some more information about the event, then visit txuujm, txuujm .org. All right. Y'all, the Healing Justice Ministry is doing some amazing stuff this month, and so you should definitely check it out. Um, today, they have Mystics and Metaphysics with Santi. You can check out the eblast for details on all of these amazing offerings. I just want to personally thank Ma Sarah and the Healing Justice Ministry for all the amazing work that you have done. All right. If you want any more information about all the stuff that I've talked about, or if you want to know what else is going on at UUCOC, you can check out the eBlast. You will find a note about potential COVID shutdowns. You know, it's going around. Uh, Workday Wednesdays and widening the circle of concern updates. They have a lot of great stuff in the works, including forming a white allies group and so much more. They are doing such great work with anti-racism within our church. So um, yeah, join them if you can. And at minimum, just go and check out the stuff that they are working on in the e -blast. I'm sure they would love to have you there. And they are a fabulous group of people. It is Sunday and we don't stop the fun after the service. No, no, no. We have Talk Back at 1115. That's where we get together and talk about the sermon and related topics. You always get something out of it, whether you'd like to offer your own opinion or just sit and listen. We also have adult religious exploration at 1115 with Sarah. That is over in the Charity North building and on Zoom. So lots of great stuff there. All right, y'all. Are you ready for some member anniversaries? I know you are. All right, everybody, give a happy UUCOC anniversary to Ed Stofko and D Stofko. <laughs> happy anniversary, you two, to the two of you and to everyone else out there. I hope that you all have a very happy Sunday. Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Oak Cliff. Thank you for having the curiosity and the courage to join us. Thank you, whoever you are whatever spiritual tradition, gender, age, race, sexual orientation, or background you may bring to our community. We hope you will find here comfort, connection, challenge, respect, and above all, love. May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, spirit of love, compassion, and forgiveness. Que esta luz que ahora encendemos nos inspire a usar nuestros dones y poderes para sanar y no para herir, para ayudar y no para impedir, para bendecir y no para maldecir, para servirte a ti, espíritu de amor, compasión y perdón.
Call to Worship and Action by Sharon Wiley. It is said that ministers are here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I say we are all afflicted and we are all comfortable. May our time together this morning be a comfort and a confrontation. May we here find peace in times of tumult. May we here invite tumult into lives of peace. May we here find calm in times of restlessness. May we here allow restlessness to evolve into action. Let this be the place you consider what you've never considered. Let this be the place you imagine for yourself something new and unthinkable. May this hour bring dreams of new ways of being in the world. Come, let us worship together. Because we love one another. Because we love one another, we honor each individual's spiritual journey. Because we love one another, we celebrate life's abundance in service to each other, our community, and the world. Because we love one another, we connect with each other in love, respect, and acceptance. Thus do we covenant together. Thank you. You are not alone with your sorrow, just as I am not alone with mine. Our covenant of right relations makes this so. You and I are bound by our promise to commune. In community, the burden of a heavy heart is shared. A burden shared is a burden lightened. At this time, we invite you to publicly post your sorrows and prayer requests to the Zoom chat or send those to our Facebook Messenger. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. I 
breathe in I breathe in peace when I breathe out I breathe out love when I breathe in I breathe in peace when I breathe out I breathe out love When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. This Sunday, like every Sunday, we reaffirm our promise to one another. Our promise makes clear the call to celebrate for that which brings you joy, makes you grateful, brings you peace. We, your sacred community, celebrate. We celebrate together and magnify joy, heighten gratitude and spread ever increasing peace. Please share your joys publicly in the Zoom chat or send those to our Facebook Messenger or speak those aloud now. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirs of compassion. In the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand, giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, we set me free. Spirit of life, come to me, come to me. Uh, good morning. This morning, I would like to talk to you about how your white supremacy footprint is a lot like your carbon footprint and what you can do about it. Um, so I have come across this metaphor. I like it. It's not perfect, um, but I think it's useful because many Unitarian Universalists understand what their carbon footprint is, um, and they're not insulted by the idea that they have one. One of the things I've noticed um, that is a real sticking point and that is getting in our way of doing the work we need to do is that there's many Unitarian Universalists who are still personally insulted by the idea that they participate in white supremacy um, and in white supremacy culture. We have this idea that white supremacy culture is, uh, is other people, it's really bad guys, it's neo-Nazis, it's the KKK, um, and actually white supremacy culture is all around us. So I'm hoping that this will help us move into, um, into a more useful place. So this uh, first section, I'll give you a quick heads up. It's pretty, it's pretty light. I guess it kind of starts to feel a little obvious after a while. Um, but uh, it's always hard to hear specifics about how you're contributing to white supremacy culture. I don't know that there's any way for it uh, to not feel bad and it feeling lousy is probably a sign that you're actually a good person um, because you care about the harm that you cause whether intentionally or unintentionally um, but let's start out with how white supremacy your white supremacy footprint is like your carbon footprint 
So let's start with some things we know about carbon footprint. Uh, we know that the scientific consensus is that humans are causing global warming and your carbon footprint is a way of thinking about how you uh, contribute to global warming. Uh, so in this metaphor, uh, in this way of thinking about white supremacy, we're uh, going to talk about our white supremacy footprint. And one thing we know is true is that there is consensus among scholars that our current economy, government, and culture is set up to exploit and oppress people of color and benefit white people. Now, this is what is referred to as white supremacy culture. So when I say white supremacy culture, remember, I'm not saying that you're a skinhead or you're part of the KKK or a terrible, terrible racist. It's just that you're participating in the way things are. And uh, the way things are is set up to benefit white people and to cause harm to people of color. So when we're when I'm talking about a white supremacy footprint, I'm talking about it as a way to think about how you contribute to white supremacy culture or the oppression of people of color, uh, whether you like it or not. So here's some things we also know about our carbon footprint. Everyone has a carbon footprint, even if you don't want to. Everyone means everyone. And we don't all have the same carbon footprint, but we do still all have one. Similarly, everyone has a white supremacy footprint. Even if you don't want to, everyone means everyone. And we don't all have the same footprint, but we do all have one. All right. With our carbon footprint, Every part of how you live your life can add or subtract from your carbon footprint. Your clothes, your food, your job, the people and the policies you vote for all impact your carbon footprint. Similarly, every part of how you live your life can add or subtract from your white supremacy footprint. Who profits from and who is exploited by the creation of your clothes, your food, um, by the job that you do, by the politics and the policies that you vote for, all of these have an impact on what your white supremacy footprint is. Okay. Now, we know and understand that our current economy is set up to use a lot of carbon. That means that most of your daily life adds to your carbon footprint. It doesn't take away from your carbon footprint. Um, similarly, our current economy, government and culture are set up to exploit and oppress people of color and benefit white people. That means that most of your daily life, whether uh, you choose to consciously or not, is adding to your white supremacy footprint. Reducing your carbon footprint requires a lot of work and intention from you, right? That's a consequence of the way the economy is. You have to intentionally work uh, against the system in order to have a negative carbon footprint. So it's really hard to have a neutral or a negative car carbon footprint lifestyle because you're actively working against the status quo. Similarly, reducing your white supremacy footprint will require work and intention from you. It's not going to happen on accident and it's not going to happen without you doing anything. It is really hard to have a white supremacy neutral or a white supremacy negative lifestyle because you have to work consciously against the system, against the way things are currently set up. Now, with our carbon footprint, most Unitarian Universalists understand that the scientific consensus is that humans are causing global warming. This means that if I disagree personally with global warming being caused by humans, I'm disagreeing with the majority of the scientific community, something most Unitarian Universalists are not willing to do. Um, disagreeing with Humans causing global warming means dis I'm disagreeing uh, with most scientists. I think most scientists are wrong or lying. Um, most Unitarian Universalists 
uh, like 99.9%, I would imagine, uh, don't think that most scientists are wrong or lying about global warming being caused by humans. Now, white supremacy is similar. The consensus among scholars, and I'm including from academia, I'm including authors, I'm including sociologists, historians, um, economists who study sociology, um, uh, black studies scholars, the consensus among scholars is that white supremacy culture is causing ongoing harm to people of color. That means this is not a thing of the past, it is a thing that is currently happening right now. Similarly, this means that if I disagree personally, I am disagreeing with the majority of scholars, activists, theologians, many of whom are Black scholars, activists, and theologians, um, who have done the work and the research on this subject. Disagreeing means that I am, uh, that I think most of these scholars are wrong or lying. And if we are willing to believe in scientists and people who do the study and the research through science, I think we need to ask ourselves why we're not willing to believe um, most Black study scholars. Why are we not willing to believe most uh, Black study sociologists? Now, our Again, what our carbon footprint being a scientific consensus for me personally, it means that I, knowing there's scientific consensus, don't personally have to understand the science. I don't personally have to read all of the studies. Um, knowing that there is scientific consensus is enough for me to believe scientists and to take the actions that those scientists recommend. Similarly, Knowing that there is consensus among the scholars who are doing the work of understanding white supremacy culture, um, that there is consensus that this is causing ongoing harm, I don't personally have to understand all of the scholarship. I don't personally have to read all of the books. I don't personally have to see racism happen in order to believe that it is happening. Um, I can believe Black scholars, Black activists, people doing Black studies, um, and I can take the actions that they recommend. Now, another way that our carbon footprint is similar to our white supremacy footprint is that we know there are definite steps that you can take to reduce your carbon footprint, such as install solar panels on your house, reduce food miles by eating local in-season produce, using and fixing your appliances as long as possible. Um, similarly, there are things that you can do to reduce your white supremacy footprints. There are concrete steps that you can take. Um, you can promote and purchase from Black-owned businesses. You can learn about microaggressions and how to avoid them. You can read and promote movies, books, and media created by people of color and thus amplify um, the voices of people of color. And also make sure that you're personally not in a white media bubble. Um, so also, it is good to take steps to reduce your personal carbon footprint. But in order to prevent further global warming, we know that that's not enough. We know that we have to work towards systemic change. Similarly, with your white supremacy footprint, it is good to take steps to reduce your personal white supremacy footprint. It's important to me personally, but I also know that in order to end the continued oppression of people of color, we must take steps to work towards systemic change. Now, what do we mean by systemic change? Systemic change means changing the large systems and ways that our world works. That's going to be things like our economy, our businesses and corporations, our governments, our schools, and our institutions. And the most important institution I want to talk to you about today is our church. Now, what do we need to change? Um, we're going to need to change our perspective. 
we're going to need to change our leadership practices and our leadership and we're going to need to change our individual part in anti-racism. Um, and some of this I'm talking to myself, uh, but I hope that you are also finding yourself in, um, in uh, the things that you can do um, in your journey. So what do we need to change in our perspective? We need to change our perspective from thinking that I'm not a part of the problem because I'm not racist and therefore I don't need to do anything to um, unless I'm personally and actively helping to fix the problem, I am allowing white supremacy culture to continue. So from thinking that not doing anything is okay to I must do something in order to change the status quo and not doing anything allows the status quo to continue. So from a perspective of, we want, also want to change from a perspective of being told that something I did was racist is offensive, insulting, and I need to defend myself because it is a mark against my character or from feeling like I can't be racist because I didn't intend my actions to be perceived that way. We need to change from that perspective to a perspective that being told that something I did was racist is an act of love and friendship. It means that that person knows that I am a good person who doesn't want to hurt others and wants to help me avoid doing so, right? Their assumption is that this is what you want. You want to do the best that you can. And so they're giving you the information to be the kind of person they believe you want to be. And we want to move from the perspective that uh, intention is an important part of whether or not something is racist to knowing that actions can be racist either intentionally or unintentionally. And not only that, but it's likely that more harm is caused by people who don't intend to be racist or to act in racist ways than by people who are intentionally racist. We also want to change our perspective from feeling like I don't know enough to do anti-racist work. I can or should leave it to other people who know better than me, and I should leave it to the experts. And we want to shift that to a perspective where we believe that every person has the responsibility to do anti-racist work. These experts that we're thinking of, and I have experts in quotes because the degree to which we're all experts is super subjective. We're all continually learning. Um, those experts that we're thinking of are actively asking for our help and have been asking for our help. And they want to help you along your journey into becoming and to being anti-racist. Um, and this is all, uh, uh, a large part of this is coming from this uh, quote, the opposite of racist isn't not racist. It is anti-racist. What's the difference? One endorses the idea of a racial hierarchy as racist or racial equality as anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people as a racist or locates the roots of problems in power and policies as an anti-racist. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is no in-between safe space of not racist. And this quote is from How to be Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. Um, and I formatted this for emphasis for myself. 
Um, a couple of things I want to point out here is I think a lot of Unitarian Universalists understand this first point um, that a racist is a person who believes in racial hi hierarchy and you're anti-racist as a person who believes in racial equality. I think Unitarian Universalists on the whole are right together on that one. It gets slightly trickier in this second uh, problem. Uh, we still don't fully understand that um, anti-racists are locating problems in power and policies. I think that's part of why we feel insulted personally when we're being told that we're participating in white supremacy culture. It's because we're still interpreting um, this uh, critique as though it's a critique of us as people and not a critique as of power, of policies, and of actions. So one of the things we want to make sure we're continuing to go back to is remembering that this is not a critique of me as a person, as a character. It's a critique of an action. It's a critique of power. It's a critique of policy. It might be a critique of the role that I'm playing in an institution. It's not a critique of me as a person. And then lastly, this is the real uh, crux, uh, the real pivot point that's going to help us move from being uh, ineffective, not racists, to effective anti-racists. Being anti-racist means you have to actively take action. Inaction preserves racial inequities, and that contributes to racism. So in order to be anti-racist or uh, in order to not be a racist, you have to take proactive action. Here are some other things that we need to change. Now, unfortunately, um, for very many reasons, uh, we know that we've been in a pandemic. We know that different people are called to different work. We know that life happens for very many reasons. Right now, the anti-racist work of widening the circle of concern does not have the full support of the board. Um, not all members of the board have participated in the study group that we've offered three times at this point. Um, some members were able to attend a few sessions, but weren't able to attend all sessions. Some members weren't able to devote their attention to those sessions because they had to multitask at the time. And some members who were very active in the work of widening the circle of concern have actually been discouraged from attending at least one meeting where the subject was relevant to the topic being discussed. Now, as a consequence of all of this, whether intended or unintended, members of our board have taken actions which perpetuate white supremacy culture in our church. So what we need in our congregation is to have leadership that supports the work of widening the circle of concern. Our congregation has multiple times voted to commit ourselves to this work, but when our leadership doesn't participate in that work because they aren't able to, our minister doesn't have an effective partner. And again, that's whether that's intentionally or not intentionally. Um, we don't have to, uh, like, we don't have to disparage each other's character about this. It's just... Uh, it's just how it is. It's just how uh, things played out. Our minister can't do the job we hired her for when our board members are feeling personally insulted by instead of welcoming of constructive feedback about the ways their actions contribute to white supremacy culture in our work, in our church. When disagreements around white supremacy culture are referred to as drama by a board member, this language is belittling and it contributes to white supremacy culture in our congregation. So we have not only board members who aren't able to participate um, in those study groups, but because they're uh, not able to participate in those study groups, they haven't learned the things that will prevent them um, from continuing to participate in white supremacy culture unintentionally or intentionally. So here is my ask of you personally. 
Um, and what you can do um, as a parishioner or a leader or a friend of uh, uni the Unitarian Universalist Church of Oak Cliff, what you can do to participate and grow in your journey as an anti-racist. First and most importantly, we need members who are committed to the work of widening the circle of concern to volunteer to serve on the board and in other positions of leadership. We've consistently said as a congregation during our parish meetings that this is some of the most important work that we're doing. Um, but our minister and our board can't do that work if for whatever reason they haven't been able to participate in the study group. Volunteers who are interested in doing this work can contact a member of the leadership development team, and that includes Kathy Gray, Kenneth Jackson, and Nancy Johnstone. This is important. This is fundamental to the work of the ministry that we have all said that we're committed to. And in order to maintain that commitment, we need members to volunteer to serve in positions of leadership and on the board. We also need multiple members who are committed to this work to volunteer to learn and to serve, prepare to serve on the board. One of the things that we've learned over the, the last couple of years is that there's a high turnover rate for board members because life happens and in these pandemic times, life happens a lot. There are a lot of people who would be more willing to serve on the board if they knew that if an emergency or something came down the line that they uh, needed to resign or to step back or to tag out for a while, um, that they would be able to do that and not be stuck trying to overcommit themselves. Giving each other those breaks that we need is a part of how we take care of each other and a part of how we honor the individual uh, dignity of each person, recognizing our humanness and that our humanness means that sometimes we have to step forward and sometimes we have to step back. And the way we have been asking our current board members to serve is not giving them that same respect. It is not letting them step forward and step back. Um, so just as our congregation um, has made this commitment um, and our board is not able to return that commitment, we're actually not as a congregation um, fulfilling and supporting our board in the way that we need to be supporting them. And we really need as many people as possible to start learning about that. Um, you don't know if whenever the, when the time comes that we need somebody, if that's gonna be a good time for you or a bad time for you. But we do know that if you start getting ready now, that's gonna increase the chances that you'll be able to say yes when the time comes. Another important way that you can support yourself in your anti-racist journey if you're white identifying is to join the white allies support group that we're forming. We're going to meet at least to begin with on the first and the third Sunday of the month because we have a lot of work to do and to get started and we want to uh, keep with the enthusiasm that we have. We're going to meet after the uh, talk back from at 1215, we're going to meet on the church campus. Um, please bring your lunch in order to you know, feed and respect the needs of your body. Um, and our goal there is really going to be to support each other and to learn it from each other about becoming anti-racist and to help each other walk through those really uncomfortable feelings um, and, and sorrow and guilt that we might feel around the ways that we've contributed to white supremacy culture um, so that we can do the work of actually changing it. Um, so a lot of that stuff is getting in our way of doing the work we want to do. Um, I'd also like to ask you to commit to be present. Um, now, I might be paraphrasing Sherry Randall, um, but I think she says it often enough that I have it memorized. And one of the things that she says is, I don't know what I bring to the table, but I know that I don't bring anything if I don't show up to the table. Being present is one of the most important ways that we can show support for the work that other people are doing. 
it's really comforting to know that we are not alone. It's exciting to see the number of people who are starting to do this work and to see that number grow. Um, and again, you don't know how you can help um, until you're there. Uh, it, it is often the case that you will participate in ways that you hadn't thought of, especially as we're learning to do the work. We don't know what skills we have yet and what we know that is gonna be helpful. I'd also like to ask you to commit to using your voice. Um, critics are often louder than supporters. This can make it seem like there are as many or more critics than supporters, even when there are far more people who would support this work than when, when, if they were asked directly. So don't wait to be asked if you support this work. Express your support directly and often to the people who are doing it and to the people who are preparing it and leading it. Be an intentional cheerleader. Also, express your support of widening the circle of concern uh, to the board by contacting your board trustees, Yolanda Graham and Sherry Randall, both of whom have been doing, uh, have participated at least once, if not twice in our study groups. And, and then lastly, don't wait, please participate. They say that if you wait to be ready uh, to be a parent, then you'll never have kids. Um, and similarly, I think that if you date until you know enough, or until you have more time, or until it becomes a problem, then you're never going to act. It's never going to seem like it's the right time. Um, there's no such thing as enough. Uh, you're, I don't think I've ever really had more time later. Um, and it is and has already been a problem. And I'd like to end with this last uh, note, which is that it is a problem. And it's a heartbreaking problem. I have, um, I've heard from people that I really love that they don't feel safe here. And I've had to say goodbye to friends who have stopped coming. And I'm tired of that. I'm really tired of that. It's really heartbreaking. I have so much faith and hope and belief in who we could be. And I really like all of the people that are here. And I really like the people who have left. And we hear again and again from Unitarian Universalists of Color that there are very, very few safe spaces for them in our congregations. Um, and I want there to be a place like that in Oak Cliff. It's so important to me. It's important to the people that I love and it's important to the people that you love. Um, so we have to act and do some hard things and make space in our lives and do things that we're uncomfortable or we don't think we're good enough to do yet. Um, and we can do that because we're going to be pulling on the thing we have the most of, which is the love that we have for one another. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be. When I was dog sitting for friends a couple of weeks ago, I was maybe on Facebook a little too, uh, too much, but I came across something posted by our very own Alicia Colley on the church's main Facebook page. It said, overanalyze again. Pick up a book, turn to page 23. This is your message from the universe today. So I looked around and, all right, well, there was one book um, in front of me on the coffee table. I picked it up. Ah, timely. How to be an anti-racist by Ibram X. Kendi. All right, let's turn to page 23. Oh, good. It's only half a page. I'm reading from the book, page 23. Racist and anti-racist are like peelable name tags that are placed and replaced based on what someone is doing or not doing, 
supporting, or expressing in each moment. These are not permanent tattoos. No one becomes a racist or anti-racist. We can only strive to be one or the other. We can unknowingly strive to be a racist. We can knowingly strive to be an anti-racist. Like fighting an addiction, being an anti-racist requires persistent self-awareness, constant self-criticism, and regular self-examination. Next paragraph. Racist ideas have defined our society since its beginning and can feel so natural and obvious as to be banal. But anti-racist ideas remain difficult to comprehend, in part because they go against the flow of this country's history. As Audre Lorde said in 1980, we have all been programmed to respond to the human differences between us with fear and loathing, and to handle that difference in one of three ways. Ignore it, and if that's not possible, copy it if we think it is dominant, or destroy it if we think it is subordinate. But we have no patterns for relating across our human differences as equals. Unquote. To be an anti-racist is a radical choice in the face of this history, requiring a radical reorientation of our consciousness. The wait list for this book at the Dallas Library is often long. To buy it, please look for and support a Black-owned bookstore in your area. Thank you. Join me in reciting the Widening the Circle of Concern Covenant that our congregation wrote and approved a spring parish meeting over a year ago, I believe it was. We, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Oak Cliff, commit ourselves to the study and dismantling of racism and oppression within our congregation. We commit our congregation and ourselves to the work of anti-racism and anti-oppression. We commit ourselves to listening, to learning, and to action. When we fail, we commit ourselves to trying again and again. We covenant to begin this work and to continue until all of us can truly say that we are a beloved community of justice, equity, and compassion. Thank you. Today, as you make your pledge or offering to support this community, let the words of Heather Christensen inspire you to generosity. Individually and together, Unitarian Universalism is a grand vision of a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. That vision is embodied in a few large congregations, numerous mid-sized congregations, and many, many small congregations. No matter its size, every congregation depends on each of its members. Each one of you by your commitment of time, energy, and resources, helps make that grand vision real. Individually and together, we are Unitarian Universalists, building a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. Yeah.
Our work has just begun by Emily Richards. Please take a moment to become present, to pause, and to notice how you are in this moment. Our work here this morning is at an end, and our work has just begun. The work of holding one another and this community in love, the work of trusting that we are on the right path, the work of believing that what connects us is stronger than what separates us, the work of engaging in that which makes us whole, the work of deeper understanding and commitment the work of letting go of that which does not serve us, the work of radical inclusion, the work of collective liberation, the work of this beloved community, a beloved community of which we are all part, a place where we are welcomed, respected, valued, cherished, a place where we belong. Go in peace. Amen. And blessed be. Hello, you, you family. I'm going to sing a song with you called Shine On Me. It's an amazing spiritual that anybody can see. Mm -hmm. And in these days, when the things that we're dealing with, the feeling separate and all of that, and things seem so hard. Mm -hmm. This is one of those songs that you just throw your head back, put it in your medicine kit. All you have to do is ask. And here's how it goes. Shine on me. Oh, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse shine on me, oh, shine on me, yes, shine on me, let the light from the lighthouse shine on me lift me up oh lift me up let the light from the lighthouse lift me up oh lift Yes, lift me up. Let the light from the lighthouse lift me up. Oh, hold, hold me close. Yes, hold, hold me close. Let the light. From the light, from the lighthouse, hold me close. Yes, hold me close. So hold me close. Let the light from the lighthouse, please, hold me close. So oh, shine, shine on me, shine on me. Yes, shine, shine on me. 
Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Yes, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse Shine on me. All you have to do is just ask. The light is always there. Always. 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 We extinguish this flame, but not the light, light of, of truth, truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Extinguimos este llama, pero no la luz de la verdad, el color de comunidad, o el fuego de nuestro compromiso. Estos los llevaremos en el corazón hasta que estemos juntos otra vez.